according to custom. The word that's being used there is according to custom. Now that is not a, a, a contradiction for me at all. I've got two fathers. I've got my own father and my wife's father, my father-in-law is also my father. And if you go about that route, you'll see that it was the custom of the Jews in that time to actually show uh, the two genealogies of Jesus. Um, I'm going to step over that. There's something, it's on that CD, all the explanations is there. I'm not going to sit a lot to that. But what I want to talk to you about tonight is a simple thing. It is, where does the manuscripts from the Bible come from? Now people tend to think that if we're going to sit and write the manuscripts of the Bible 2,800 years or 4,000 or 3,000 years ago, we will keep this thing and it's going to be in a glass case. That is not the case. It works this way. God speaks to the prophet. The prophet speaks to the people. The people will obviously have people that will write all these things down. That's why you won't find authors in the Bible. I don't care if, it's no, if certain books doesn't have authors in the Bible. It doesn't do anything to the context what's written inside the Bible. The words of God is contained in that. Why do we want to place a rule that we want today, get copyrights on this and we must place it in cabinets and make sure that we know who was the author? It did not exist. These books belonged to the priests of Israel for all those years. Can I just get a bit of water here? So, if God tells a prophet, this is my words, people will write it down and we will have these books. Now, if we're going to write down a book in the time of Habakkuk, he will have this, let's say, seven, eight hundred years before Christ. How long will that manuscript last? Ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to last 40 years. And is there only going to be one manuscript? It's not going to be one manuscript. Because there's a lot of people who to read this. And there's a lot of uh, synagogues and it must be sent out to all the parts of the nation. So you're not going to have just one copy. You're going to have hundreds of copies being written out. Now I'm telling you, if you sit with a copy of any manuscript of the Bible in your hand, you will not even know if it is the original. Now, taking the time from 4,300 years, 2,800 years ago, how many times will we have used up these copies? And this is exactly what happened with the Dead Sea Scrolls. They became obsolete. They were damaged. The ink was already coming off. So we will put them in flasks and we'll go and bury them. Or we will just replace another one. But the thing to remember is that the manuscripts that you're going to have, the ones that we can have now, was done so carefully by those scribes that they considered it to be the exact copy of the original. Now, I'm not going to go into the textual criticism because I don't have the time for this here now tonight. I can just tell you that I'm certain that the manuscripts that we have for the Bible in existence today and obviously quotations of the early church fathers describes exactly what stands in my Bible. And again, I'm going back on the Old Testament and we can see. Now the word Bible, why do we want a name for a book? I'm worried about this. Is the word Quran so, in, uh, so important to the Muslim? Can I not say it's the book of God? Why do you want me to put the name Bible? Uh, somebody must refer to it. I can't understand because that does not show to me it's from God. The words that the Prophet received there, that is the words of God. I'm just going to carry on. We, uh, we saw the contradiction here about the fell with four feet. Unicorns. These animals doesn't exist. You know, we are living 2000, in the year 2008 now. We don't know what animals existed two and a half thousand, three hundred years ago. I'm going to tell you now, I've got pictures of fossils that was a bird with four legs. I've got it on my laptop, my battery is dead. Um, I will give it, it's on the CD. Anyway, it's on the CD. You can look, I've got a list there of about 20 animals that got extinct. If you, if you just take this into consideration, now they say every hour 17 species of plants and animals goes extinct. You know the dodo died out in 17 something, the blue bug died out in 16 something. Uh, who says those animals didn't live? Is that proof to me that the Bible is wrong because these animals got extinct? I can't believe that. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible is much more ancient than what we are sitting here today in 2008. Those animals did exist. Now, the one thing, another thing is, um, if we're going to look at mainstream scholars, I did not quote the mainstream scholars, Muslim scholars, 
in their quotes against the Quran and how things was taken out and placed in there and how it was changed and all these things. I'm one man and if I see something wrong, I will tell you. We're not going to vote as Yusuf Isla, uh, Yusuf, I keep on forgetting, uh, Cat Stevens, Yusuf um, uh, Ismail. As, <laughs> oh, Cat. Um, in other words, what he tells me is that we must have a majority of people to show us if something is wrong. Isn't that what happened with Constantine then? I can't accept that reasoning. So I'm still going back to the contents of the Bible. There's a lot of uh, contradictions that's been given here. The flood. It's a pity that I could not show you what the Bible really says about the creation. Because then you will see scientific facts coming from day one right through to day seven. And a thousand five hundred years later on how the atmosphere pulled out of the earth and it flooded the earth and where the oceans went to. Scientists keep on asking me where does the water come from where did it go to the Bible tells us that but that's for some other time I've written that book on that CD please read it and uh, phone me and tell me if you if you like that so um, I'm not gonna go into I just want to give you this one uh, sh uh, the earth is flat and Satan took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world did he show him the Roman Empire? Did he show him the Catholic Empire? Did he show him the Muslim Empire? Did he show him the American Empire? The Europe? People? He showed him. They stood on the mountain and he showed him. Maybe he had something like a laptop. I don't know. He said, this is the kingdoms that will come. Does that mean the Bible is flat? No, it does not. And what is the other? I can't remember the other reference. Oh, in Daniel. It says there, and the king had a dream. And this tree could have been, uh, they saw this tree from the ends of the earth. It doesn't say the earth is flat. It was a dream that Nebuchadnezzar, I think it was Nebuchadnezzar. He had this dream. Obviously, in a dream, you will be able to see all these things. Um, again, I'm not going to talk about the scientific facts. I just want to uh, see what was the other contradictions. I just want to ask something. What does corrupt mean? I'm going to throw a snake amongst the Muslim scholar and the Christian scholar. You don't have to go back to the Greek manuscripts to find out which one is the correct one and which one is not. You just have to do two things. You get yourself a 1933 Afrikaans Bible and you get yourself the Nieuwe Vertaling. Those are the two different manuscripts in the world. And this is where the mainstream Christians has a problem with each other. Because the one Bible talks about 1 John 5 and 7. And there are three words in the Himmel, the Father, the Son and the Heilige Geest. In other words, this Bible has that truth. The other one didn't, doesn't have that. But I, I urge you, get these two Bibles and go and sit and read them one by one. And you'll find, I think it's something like six or seven passages that change there. So you've got your two different. I don't believe in the Sinaiticus Vaticanus. I don't believe in the Stuttgart uh, Lenegra Tensha. I believe in the Texas Receptus in the New Testament. That's why I believe in the Afrikaans 1933 version. But I did not prepare to come here to teach you about the, uh, the, the scriptures. What I did find is, do not stay away from the people that are criticizing your Quran. Don't stand on the point of tell and telling me the Quran did not change for 1,200 years, 1,400 years. Because there are Muslim people that gives these evidence. And even if it was changed very little, as the Bible is changed between those two versions, admit it. Don't hide it. It's going to do nothing. Nothing on the context of what stands in your holy books. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to carry on here. Uh, I thank everybody for the time that I had. Uh, if uh, anybody would like to just go through my CD, they'll find all these contradictions. I've written one that was posted on the RPCI's internet. Uh, all the answers in the, is on that CD also. There's not enough time for us. We will sit here for 3,000 years and go everything through and then we will have the answer. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. That was very informative. Now we're going to have a rebuttal by Yusuf. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Thanks once again for that pit. I think this is, uh, as someone had said in a debate uh, that took place in Indonesia last year, it's a lot of fun when you have two different diverse opinions on different issues of beliefs, religion, theology, and so on. It's great to have this kind of discussion. Pit, you said just one thing, and I just want to delve onto this. You accept the 1933 Afrikaans version. 
Correct. That's it. The text is repeat. The, the 1933 Afrikaans version of the Bible is based on what? It's based on the King James Version. It's a translation of the King James Version. And the King James Version is what we are told 52 scholars of the highest eminence, 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different cooperating denominations. They say that this very King James Version is fraught with grave defects, is based upon a Greek text that was marred by errors. And the Afrikaans translation, which you admit you support, that's in fact based upon the King James Version, the King James translation. And the Afrikaans Version has the first epistle of John chapter 5 verse 7 it has a verse in the Trinity it has a verse in the Ascension it has a verse in the woman caught in the act of adultery it has all those other verses which now all the modern Bibles including the King James Version in its most updated edition have now thrown out as fabrications Trinity not there Ascension not there over and above the hundreds of other verses which I showed you in the different slide presentations so that's a problem which you need to deal with um, coming to the issues, and you've raised um, a number of points, I'd just like to tackle with them. Regarding the issue of the creation, you say that there is no scientific problem with the creation itself. Now, that is a problem. Because when you look at Zakir Naik's debate with Dr. William Campbell in 2000, he mentioned certain points which need to be dealt with. In the first book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it mentions the existence of water before the creation of the universe. God's Spirit flowed on the waters before the creation of the universe. In verses 3 and 5, it speaks about the existence of lights before the creation of the source of that light. The sun was not created until, the, uh, I believe, the fourth day. In verses 9 to 13, it speaks about the existence of a highly organized vegetable kingdom before the creation of the sun. How is it possible that the vegetables will basically grow without nourishment from sunlight? How is that possible? In verses 14 to 19, it speaks about the creation of the sun after the creation of the earth. We know today that all the planets evolved from the solar system, the sun. That was the source. So if on the one hand we accept these points and we say that there's no variances with modern science, how do we explain these particular scientific discrepancies? We don't have time to deal with it. Uh, Maurice Bukhail, which my learned friend has alluded to, deals with it in an entire chapter. Check the entire chapter on the Old Testament and science. He spends an entire chapter dealing with the problems in terms of science in the very first book of Genesis. Regarding the book of Daniel about the tree going up to the end, yes, that was a vision, that was a dream which he had. But his dream and his vision was based on what? Based on the understanding at that particular time in history. And the understanding at that particular time in history was that the earth was flat. When, God took, when Satan took Jesus to the top of the mountains and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, there were not many kingdoms of the world existing. The Islamic empire was not there. The American empire was not there. There were just a few empires. And if he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, did he show him all or did he show him just some? If the Bible says it showed him all, then this could only be possible if the earth was flat. Because if the earth was round, you would not be able to see the opposite end of the earth. The other problem which you've raised here, uh, Pitt, and um, I just want to deal with this because it, that in itself is a lecture on its own. The um, actual text on the Quran, the, the, you, you spoke about the style, the format, the, the nuance in terms of the text. Now, I'll just give you a practical demonstration. For example, in the book of Matthew chapter 1 verse 1, it says this is a genealogy of Jesus Christ. How? The origin, the beginning. Now, after the death of the Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass. In other words, so it happened once upon a time. Now, after the death of Joshua, it came to pass. So it happened once upon a time that the children of Israel went out. Now it came to pass. So it happened once upon a time. So it gives the indication that the style or format of this uh, uh, Old Testament and indeed the New Testament is biographical. You can't deny that. For example, Matthew 9 9. And as Jesus was walking by the way, he saw a tax collector by the receipt of custom called Matthew. And he, Jesus, said unto Matthew, Follow me. And he, Matthew, arose and followed him, Jesus. Did God write that? Did Jesus write that? Did Matthew himself write that? If Matthew wrote that, he would have said, and as he, Jesus, was walking by the way, he saw me sitting at the receipt of custom, and he came unto me and called me, and I arose and followed him. 
This is from the third person. It gives the indication that Matthew himself never wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Now in the Quran itself, for example, you'd find the first call. It will state that the Prophet Muhammad was 40 years old. He went to the cave of Hira. He meditated. Suddenly the archangel came up to him. He tells him, read, Iqra. He says, Ma'ana biqoriya. He tells him the second time, third time, Iqra. The Prophet says, Ma'ana biqoriya. I cannot read. Then it goes on, Iqra. Bismi rabbika alladhi khalak. Khalak al-insana min alak. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akwam. And so on. Now the, the word ma'ana biqari'a, meaning I cannot read, is not to be found in the Quran. Why not? Because those were the words of Muhammad. Those were the words of Muhammad that was not the word of God. So the word of God is there. You won't find anywhere stating he was 40 years old or he went to the cave of Hira. That is a historical account found in the books of Hadith, found in the Tafsir, found in Ibn Hisham, in Ibn Ishaq and so on. That's not there. In fact, quite interesting enough, if you're speaking about the advent of Islam in the book of Daniel, but in fact, if you're looking at Isaiah chapter 29 verse 12, it says, And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I cannot read. Now show us one prophet or character in history where this basically happened. Or, and he came forth from Mount Paran with a fiery law, and he was accompanied by 10,000 saints. Which particular person and individual in history was ever accompanied by 10,000 saints, 10,000 companions? None other than the Prophet Muhammad. So you need to look at this quite clearly and quite deeper before we make certain um, suggestions that's in the third. It's not in the third person. You'd have, for example, quotations referring to events and so on. But look at the text. If we had more time, I would have dealt with passages and verses of the Quran and would have done a word for word, verse for verse comparison to see whether this is a word of God or whether this is a word of man. In fact, my challenge was even the other time, even if one were to not accept that the Quran is not the word of God, if one were to reject it, an outsider who reads it would see for himself it is as if God himself is speaking, even if you reject it. But the style is there. That it is for us to uh, collect this particular, so it is for us to basically preserve it. Who is this us? Who is we? That's a royal plural. It's God Almighty speaking. We don't have such verses in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You'd have verses, I, even I am God and so on. But that's in parentheses, in brackets narrated by a scribe, by a biographer, by someone who was writing, by a third party, by these unknown assumed authors that I had basically shown you and um, collected. Regarding the text of the Quran itself and the um, actual uh, recension, the Quran was revealed in the dialect of the Quraysh, which was the literary language of Arabia. Now, Towards the close of the Prophet's life, what had happened was that people from different Arabian tribes, they had come and they had accepted Islam in large numbers. What happened? It was found that these different tribes could not pronounce certain words in the idiom of the Quraysh, in the Qurayshi dialect. And so being habituated from childhood with that particular idiom, that nuance, that style, it was then that the Prophet allowed them to pronounce these words according to their own particular idiom. But that permission was only given to facilitate the recitation of the Quran. The written Quran was essentially one. And it was the chest idiom of the Quraysh, the Qurayshi dialect was preserved because those people belonging to other tribes were allowed to pronounce it in certain particular manners, but in terms of the text, what you would call the textus receptus, that was preserved in the Qurayshi dialect. So it's important you, you need to know that. The different texts of Hafsa and Abu Bakr and so on, it didn't differ any, in any significant sense from what Uthman had. But what the concern was that over a period of time, if people start pronouncing the Quran in different dialects with dialectical difference, over a period of time it could happen or be possible that these particular dialectical difference could arise and in a sense corrupt the text. So to prevent that, what Uthman did was that he made the Qureshi dialect standardized as you basically said. But there would be even no need for that. Why not? Because the Quran was essentially preserved in memory. So if someone were to make a mistake in the front, I could easily correct him. 
And that's a difference that you have in the Bible. The Quran was always in the hands of the people. The Bible was always in the property of the church. It was never in the hands of the people. And even those manuscripts of the New Testament which we talk about today, back then many of the church fathers, uh, many of the followers never accepted them as the word of God. Uh, Pitt spoke about the church fathers. There's that pamphlet we gave you out here. This particular book, Textual Reliability and Accuracy of the New Testament. You read this book, it speaks about the patristic citations, about the so-called church fathers. Biblical scholars will tell us that even if you look at all the church fathers' writings, they cannot reconstruct the New Testament. So why make that claim? Why make the claim that you can reconstruct the New Testament using patristic citations? When those patristic citations made by people like Irenaeus, by Tertullian and so on, those same church fathers, for example, had different beliefs to you, Pitt. They never accepted that Jesus was God. They never accepted that Jesus was the Son of God. So why use them as a source to say that the Bible is authentic when they went against the dogma of existing Christian belief which evolved at a later time? That's a problem that we have. Um, Pitt made mention about a book called Al-Quran, The Ultimate Miracle. Now, that ultimate miracle which was apparently published by the IPC, I think sometime in the 79, 80, it was based on one of the works of Rashad Khalifa. Rashad Khalifa has been exposed as a fraud. What they did, as you rightfully pointed out, was that he constructed a, a particular mathematical interlocking chain system based on the number 19. And he said that, look, based on this, the Quran is uh, preserved. And so there's two additions. Which, and which were those? verses which he said were fabricated. The verses were جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولُ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتْتُمْ عَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَوْفُ الرَّحِيمُ فَإِنْ تَوَلَّوْ فَقُلْ حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَّا إِلَّهُ أَلَّهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَهُوَ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْعَظِيمُ He said those verses were fabricated. No Muslim in his sane mind would ever view that those particular verses as fabricated. Look at the meanings. Look at the translation. And therefore his views were rejected, he's a minority. In fact, the submitters are in a minority. They're based in Tushon in Arizona. No one even takes them seriously. So we can't look at the workings of cults and say now the Quran is not authentic. In all the, the slides you've got, I looked at the workings and the research of mainstream scholars, some of them conservative scholars. Some of the main source of Christianity, the actual Bible itself, what does it say about itself? the preface to the Revised Standard Version or the preface to the Collins Edition, authors of the Bible, we looked at the text itself. We cannot rely now on cults or what this person says or another sect or denomination says. We need to be honest in that respect. And there's just so many points I'd like to raise here. I just want to deal with the issue of the issue pertaining to prophecy. Pitt mentioned about the fact that Islam is prophesied in the book of Daniel. Now you ask any fundamentalist Christian, a Baptist, he will tell you there's no reference to Islam in the book of Daniel. I ask a Seventh-day Adventist, he will tell me that the book of Daniel speaks about the beast. Who is the beast? He will tell you it's Pope. It's a Roman Catholic Church. So if the Seventh-day Adventist basically says that the book of Daniel prophesies the Roman Catholic Church, and you are saying that the uh, book of Daniel speaks about Islam, and mainstream Christians say there's nothing about Islam in the Bible, who am I to accept? In fact, speaking about prophecies, and if prophecies are the test, you look at Genesis chapter number 4 verse 12. It speaks about God told Cain, you will never be able to settle, you will forever be a wanderer. Four verses later, Genesis chapter 4 verse 17, we are told Cain built up a city. Unfulfilled prophecy. It's mentioned in Jeremiah chapter number 36 verse number 30. It says, Jerachan, who is a father of Jerachan, no one will be able to sit on his throne. The throne of David, no one will be able to sit on his throne. If you read later on in 2 Kings chapter 24 verse number 6, it says, Jerachan died. Later on, uh, Jerachan, his son, sat on the throne. Unfulfilled prophecy. Book of Ezekiel, chapter number 26, it speaks about Nebuchadnezzar, whom Pitt mentioned, will destroy Tyre. Nebuchadnezzar will destroy Tyre. We know that according to history, it was Alexander the Great who was the first person to destroy Tyre, not Nebuchadnezzar. So it's an unfulfilled prophecy. Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 14. The differences in terms of Alma and Bethula, was it a young woman, was it a virgin, that's a problem biblical scholars have to still deal with. Um, unfortunately, with topics of this nature, you can go on for hours and certainly these particular points and views, but it's important that Christians need to look at their 
texts, Muslims themselves, we also need to be introspective. He mentioned certain aspects in hadith. We need to question. Hadith is also, in certain instances, biographical narrations. The isnads might be weak. The chain of narrators might be weak. So we need to be honest in terms of how we view our scripture and our text. But the point is we say the Quran is the invariable word of God. And to date, no serious scholar of note has ever raised a question where he has challenged and basically brought the authenticity of the Quran to doubt. I thank you for that. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Tonight we've shown that uh, obviously I'm a Muslim and people were worried that tonight we would be impartial, that somehow we'd take one side or the other. But tonight we're here not to take sides, we're here to learn from each other and we're here to, we're all searching for the same thing. In the Bible it says, search for the truth and the truth will set you free. And as Muslims we agree with that. We know that we are searching for the truth and the truth will set us free. And there's no problem in looking it's just where you look sometimes it might be a problem so continue searching for the truth and as we take questions from the the, the, the people tonight I ask that you may ask questions and, and don't make statements if you want to make statements we can always organize another debate but try to ask questions to the to, to the two speakers that are pertinent my question is to uh, it's Trey Dom want to come up? he considers the Bible the Word of God every word of it if there is a contradiction, I want to know what will it be then? For example, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke each give a completely different time for the birth of Jesus. Matthew chapter 2 verse 1 states that Jesus was born during the reign of King Herod prior to 4 BC. Luke chapter 2 verse 1 to 7 indicates that Jesus was born during a census when Quirinius was governor of Syria and we know that was 6 AD a total of 10 years after the death of Herod clearly either Matthew's gospel is partly fiction or the Luke gospel is partly fiction however they both cannot be true did God inspire the authors to write mistakes and contradictions in his scriptures sorry please make the, the question short and precise because it's we don't have statements like I said earlier just make just ask a question and let them answer it so I just want to say there's such a lot of contradictions being uttered that I can't keep tally of this anymore we have, in the New Testament, we have four versions of Jesus' life on earth. This is a new one for me. I've never heard that. Now, I want to tell you that if I take the Bible, it's a big volume. If I'm going to go through this, I will have to refer back to history. I've never heard that contradiction. So obviously, what I will do, I will work it out and I will send that to the IPCI and I will show that.